Without further ado, let's get started. I'd like to introduce to you today Dr. Aviva Ram. I have listened to her presentations before, and I always walk away with information uh, that is incredibly important that I not only didn't know but had no idea that uh, was uh, pertinent to the problem at hand. She is a Yale-trained board-certified MD. Uh, she is a midwife and an herbalist. She's a founding board member of Yale Integrative Medicine. Uh, by Prevention Magazine, they referred to her as the face of natural medicine in the 21st century. Her focus is primarily in women's health. Uh, she addresses challenges like weight issues, thyroid problems, adrenal problems, hormonal imbalances, and the impact of stress. And her newest book is called The Adrenal Thyroid Revolution, and it is available now as we speak. And so without further uh, ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Aviva Ram. Welcome, Dr. Ram. Thank you for having me, and Cheryl and Lexi, thank you both for putting this together. I'm so glad to be back with you. Can you hear so we're me? so delighted. Yes, we can. We're oh, delighted okay. to have you with us as well. So I'm going to turn the presentation over to you, and if you have any uh, questions, we'll all be on. We're just going to mute our lines so that we keep down the background noise. Okay, great. Let's see, I'm not seeing the, pr the presentation yet. If you'll ah, there we go. Okay, there we beautiful. go. Okay, got it. Is it is it advancing for you? Okay. Uh, let me uh, get to the first slide, and here we go. All right. All right. Let me see if I'm on full screen. I know the presentation like the back of my hands. So if I can't see a couple of words, I'll be fine. <laughs> okay, so. What's going on? These were the prophetic words of Marvin Gaye in the 1970s, actually, when he talked about mercury in our fish and his famous song and a lot of other environmental factors that were contributing to what he prophetically um, called out as problems for the human race. And I think, you know, 40 some odd years later, we are living that prophecy, sadly. And um, I think in understanding what's going on for women and men, my work, um, my training is actually internal and family medicine. So until about two years ago, I worked full spectrum women, men, and kids. But my work as a midwife has always uh, led me toward a propensity women and kids. So my practice is now focused on women and children. And I've been seeing a lot of problems in women's health that have driven some pretty significant concerns for me and over the past 10 years have caused me to take a dive into research in a certain direction that I want to share with you today. And I think it'll be not only enlightening for each of you who's listening, women and men, and transformative for practitioners for a direction to go, for answers to problems that we don't always know how to solve, but also, you know, my hope for this talk today and for my book and for my work is to help women have a greater sense of this isn't my fault but there is something I can take responsibility for and make change and that can actually have a big impact on my health. And my goal is also to help women and help practitioners understand small shifts that we can take that actually lead to big changes and big outcomes. So it's not rocket science, but it's, uh, it does require some new knowledge. So let's see. All right, I'm not advancing again here. There we go. So my book opens with a quote that says, when sleeping women wake, mountains move. And I just love this quote, particularly when we're talking about adrenal and thyroid problems, because one of the biggest presenting symptoms we see and one of the biggest challenges women have is just chronic exhaustion. And the idea that 30 million women alone we know have a hypothyroid or hypofunctioning thyroid and at least 15 more million women have thyroid problems, usually hypothyroid, that they don't know about, suggests to me that there are a lot of women out there in the world who are struggling with fatigue that's really keeping them from living their best lives. And so the idea is what can we do to help women to wake from this perpetual and overwhelming fatigue so that they can move mountains not only in their lives, but women are such a huge force for positive change in the world that we're at such a loss. Um, with all those women who can't participate on a day-to-day -day basis because they're so tired. Okay, so what are most women experiencing? Well, what I have found in my practice is that 
whatever women are experiencing physically, whether it is a known thyroid problem, uh, insulin resistance, overweight, sleep problems, you name it, really running the gamut from fertility problems to menopausal problems hormonally, most women are feeling like they're in a tremendous amount of overwhelm. And this overwhelm is having a huge impact on their ability to function. Very few people, I think, and even if we could raise hands here, I think very few of us would say, oh, yeah, we spend most of our life relaxed and coping and everything's great. I think most of us are experiencing this sort of upper end of this uh, panic meter here. We mostly spend our lives stressed, stressed bordering on anxious and overwhelmed, and not always having overt panic attacks, although that has certainly increased um, among patients in the past few years. And the number of prescription anti-anxiety medications has drastically gone up, including potentially dangerous addictive medications like benzos, which are commonly used. Most people are feeling overwhelmed, and the studies bear this out very concretely, that at least 70% of Americans would report themselves at any given time as being overwhelmed. Unfortunately, this cartoon, even though it's kind of funny and ironic, is quite drastically and tragically sad. What most women hear from their doctors when they go in saying, I'm tired, I've gained weight in the past three months, and I have no idea why, and sometimes this can be substantial weight gain. It's not just always a like a five-pound weight gain. I've had patients go in with 30-pound weight gains, other doctors, before they come to see me, and they get sort of this pat answer, uh, your labs look great, so you're fine, nothing's wrong. As we see in this picture, this woman is clearly not fine, and the doctor's not even looking at her, he's looking at the lab report. So there are a couple of things that are going on. One is a gap between what we as physicians are taught, which is you can't really diagnose something until somebody meets the criteria for diagnosis and what women are actually experiencing. Because with every new era of human evolution and human change, we see new medical conditions. So 50 years ago, there was no such thing as chronic fatigue syndrome. It's not that it wasn't being diagnosed or recognized. Our grandmothers didn't experience that. Autoimmune conditions are rampantly on the rise, not just in adults, but in children. I mean, when I was even in my medical training, not that crazy long ago, type, when I started, type 1 diabetes was virtually unheard of in kids, and now we're seeing it dramatically on the rise. Women are increasingly uh, experiencing autoimmune conditions, especially Hashimoto, thyroiditis, but other ones, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's, lupus, MS, uh, and a number of others. And we now know that women are five to eight times li more likely than men to develop an autoimmune condition. And autoimmune conditions are now amongst the top eight leading causes of death for women. So this is really significant. On average, it takes a woman five years of seeing multiple different practitioners to get an appropriate diagnosis for autoimmune disease. The other thing is that we're facing a, society, a medical society in which there are discrepancies in guidelines. And so a woman might not meet criteria, for example, of Hashimoto's according to the most common set of guidelines used by doctors, but there are other operational sets of guidelines that many endocrinologists and progressive and functional medicine doctors think that should be used, which would actually be a catchment for more women to have their unexplained symptoms explained. So why are so many women experiencing not only autoimmune conditions, but why are we having tripling of rates of obesity and overweight, uh, diabetes, increased rates of cardiovascular disease, dementia, but also increased rates of pretty, many, pretty much all hormonal problems across the board, uh, and inflammatory problems, so endometriosis, PCOS, fertility problems, et cetera. Why is one in four women experiencing depression, and why are so many women experiencing anxiety? Part of what's going on um, is that there's what's called an evolutionary mismatch in how we're living and what we are biologically or evolutionarily uh, developed to experience and respond to. And the reason I use this picture here 
of the um, cheetah and these, I'm assuming, gazelles. I'm not quite sure what these little mammals, cute little mammals are. But what happens is, if you've seen the Nature Channel, a very familiar phenomenon. As you see in the, in the image on the right, these gazelles are at the watering hole, just minding their own business. They're relaxing. What happens is, when they smell a pride or a pack of cheetahs coming into their territory, they tense up their ears prick up, their eyes dilate, they start sniffing the air because to them the smell of cheetah is the smell of warning. It's a warning sign that gets their uh, primitive stress response activated. They then run and try to evade the cheetahs that are chasing them. Now the cheetahs are also activated because they need to get food to survive. So much like we get activated when we need to go to work and pay the bills, they're motivated by a stress drive to eat as well. It's a primitive stress drive. And the gazelles are motivated by a drive to escape death by cheetah. Um, what happens is the, the cheetah catches the oldest, the sickest, the youngest, whatever, hopefully not the baby, right? I'll be a little sentimental here as a mom and a grandma. My granddaughter would want me to say, not the baby, Viva. But they'll catch one of the, the gazelles. The cheetahs will relax and go eat their meal. And the gazelles will do what? They're not sitting there shaking in their boots. They're not freaking out. They're not running and scattering and, and, you know, crying. They actually just go right back to the watering hole and finish their hydration and go about their business. That's how the stress response is supposed to work. But for most of us, we don't have these short, infrequent bursts of stress. We have frequent, multiple times a day bursts of stress that get this same system activated. We are incredibly um, capable of an enormous level of adaptation to stress. I mean, if you think about what people live in around, uh, the circumstances people live in around the world. I mean, I spent a month doing medical care in Haiti some years ago, doing obstetrics and pediatrics and emergency care. And, you know, it's amazing. It was amazing to me that people can wake up in the morning and smile and be so kind and go about their day, given the level of dire poverty and just incredible medical challenges and social challenges and access to food challenges. And yet they did. We're, we're enormously adaptable. And yet at some point, the frequency of adaptation and the types of adaptation and exposures that we're having in our Western world are taxing our systems, and particularly people who are more vulnerable, for example, people who have had trauma in the past or childhood neglect or abuse or a depressed parent or an alcoholic parent, those people are even more hardwired to be primed to being less able to adapt or to have a lower set point to their adaptive response and um, get triggered. So how does this system work? Well, it's located in your brain and extends into your adrenals in what's called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. The first warning signs actually happen in two uh, little organs that are part of your brain, little areas of your brain called the amygdala, which just means almond shaped. And those are like an external surveillance system. They're literally like a camera that's noting anything externally, but also internally that can be a sign of warning or danger. So externally, it could be, for example, smelling smoke when you're not supposed to smell smoke because it's a primitive warning sign. It could be seeing someone out of the corner of your eye when you're in a parking garage by yourself or a dark street. It could be someone's facial expression if you register that they're angry or disapproving of you. And particularly, it could even be your interpretation of that facial expression. They might just be thinking about something that's stressing them and you're thinking it has to do with you because that facial expression reminds you of one that an agitated parent made or an unstable parent made or a depressed parent made. So anything that triggers your primitive hard wiring to say that you might be in some level of threat or danger. And as I mentioned, there can be internal warning signs as well. For example, hunger is a big primitive trigger, as is um, anything that causes you emotional disruption. But I'm going to get to um, some other things that can be triggers in a, in a minute. What happens is these amygdala act like um, somebody who is using their iPhone to record a danger that they see. They, they see somebody, you know, doing something on the street that they're not supposed to do, and they send that image to uh, 911. 
That 911 internally is your hypothalamus. It's the central signaling center for your hormones and your nervous system. And one of the central signals that it does is alert your body to danger. It sends a dispatch message down to your pituitary gland, and your pituitary gland then sends both hormonal and nervous system messages, messages down to your adrenal glands. Your adrenal glands, for those of you who are new to this, are two tiny little glands. They're triangular, fatty-looking, yellowish glands. That just means that they secrete hormones or secrete chemicals that sit right on top of each kidney. And what they are primarily producing as a response to this perception or this actual threat that you're under are a, a, a catecholamine neurotransmitter called adrenaline and a hormone called cortisol. Oops, I want to go yet. Um, and what these do is set out a series of uh, reactions in your body that allow you to respond to, evade, and be protected in the setting of danger. So adrenaline gets your heart rate going, it increases your alertness, it makes you what's called hypervigilant, so you're super aware of the environment around you, your peripheral vision is expanded, your pupils dilate, uh, it's sending more blood flow to your brain and to your extremities so that you can be aware of the danger, respond to it very quickly, and run or fight. So this is the fight or flight response. Uh, in the process, it's diverting energy in, in the form of uh, hormones and chemicals and blood flow away from areas of the body that don't really need attention during an emergency, specifically your reproductive organs and the production of reproductive hormones like um, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone, as well as away from your gut. You don't need to think about digestion. Your body doesn't need to be preoccupied with the work of digestion when there's an emergency, nor does it need to be preoccupied with making you uh, making you sexually stimulated or having you reproduce. That's just not a sensible thing to do in that time. It also diverts thought processes away from calculated intentional thought into more reactive, intuitive, or instinctive responses. So you go away from willpower, choice, and cognitive function into a much more reactive behavioral uh, pathway. Cortisol, at the same time, if you have a very quick um, reaction, so for example, you are in that parking garage and you're by yourself, it's seven o'clock at night, it's winter, it's dark, and you hear footsteps, you might have a quick response, right? Especially if you're a woman alone, you might have a quickening of your heart rate, you might catch your breath, your ears prick up, you're looking around, but the second that you see it, it's just your girlfriend or a coworker and that you're safe, you know, you kind of let down your guard, your shoulders drop, you exhale, and you may giggle or have a little tiny bit of nervous energy depending on how anxious you got, but you don't go into a full-blown fight-or-flight reaction. You calm down really quickly. But if that threat or sense of danger persists or starts to recur multiple times a day, as happens when we are sort of trying to be all and do all and keep up with everything, a secondary activation starts to happen and your body starts to produce cortisol. Now, cortisol is liberated in small amounts during that initial fight or flight, but a more sustained release starts to happen under chronic stress. Now, cortisol is sometimes called the stress hormone. I call it the survival hormone because it's one of the hormones that we literally cannot survive without. If you didn't produce cortisol or get medical cortisol, if you stop producing cortisol endogenously, you would actually literally die, and quite quickly. It's also the hormone that is produced to keep us in survival mode and to survive dangers. It is responsible for liberating sugar from your liver and from other stores so that when you do need to fight or flight, that sugar is going to your muscles so that you have fuel to respond. It's also sending a tremendous amount of sugar to your brain in order to also be quickly reactive and aware. Cortisol, at the same time, uh, enhances or activates your immune response. So during that fight, or during that fight, should you get injured, you are uh, already pre-activating your response to fight infection. It also gets your blood pressure elevated so that should you get injured to the point where you're hemorrhaging, you don't immediately go into shock. At the same time that it's doing this, and particularly in response to the sugar release that I mentioned, it's also producing insulin so that when the danger is over, 
do um, your that sugar that's liberated is taken back up promptly into your cells so it's not circulating and causing undue inflammation. Cortisol over time uh, has a number of effects that lead this symptom system to become too much of a good thing and backfire. So let's look at what can happen when that when that happens. This slide here is really representative of partly why women and why I geared my book toward women are, are especially susceptible to the impact of stressors in our lives. We are, from the time we're young girls, kind of taught to take care of everybody else, put our own needs second, if at all. You know, we are the opposite of what the airline stewardess tells us to do on an airplane, first thing, which is to put on our own oxygen mask before we try to help everybody else. And as a result, we end up really multitasking and, and overextending ourselves. And, you know, just on a statistical uh, basis, more women are working out of the home than ever. And there are more women who are primary income providers or uh, the, the chief income provider out, uh, out earning their male partners. Yet women who are married to men who stay at home and take care of the household are much more likely to, in addition, still be doing things like the grocery shopping, the housework, and the meal preparation, and the childcare. And interestingly, several studies in the past couple of years have shown that women who are married to partners, male partners who stay at home and do the housework and the other um, home support activities I mentioned are much more likely to be divorced by their partners. So there's a real big schism in what's going on internally for women that's compounding the amount of stress that we're under. For a number of reasons too, partly the way we're hardwired, women are more susceptible to feeling the impact of stress in relationships. It's partly due to our oxytocin wiring and the way we're hardwired to be more attentive to the needs of others, partly because that is our caretaker role biologically um, that acts as a preservation mechanism for the children in our care. But because of that, we are more likely to experience cortisol dysregulation when we hear about our partner's bad day. M women who hear about their partner's bad days have cortisol elevations where men, uh, unhealthy ones, whereas men who hear about their women partners bad day don't have those cortisol elevations. All impacts of relationship stress cause women more stress than men. Um, further, uh, women are more likely to have physical uh, impact of stress and health problems related to stress than men are, partly due to the um, demands of the hormonal changes that we go through in various aspects of our life cycles, but also due to some of the potential inflammatory impact of estrogen. So there are a lot of complex reasons that women are just more susceptible to the impact of stress physically and um, also to the impact of um, the backfiring of cortisol, which I'm about to explain to you. So I've talked about the emotional and psychological impact of kind of always being in the on position, the way we're living our 24-7 lives. But I also want to emphasize that stress is more than a feeling. There are actual physical environmental triggers that also activate the stress response, that also activate the HPA axis to release adrenaline and to release cortisol and to put us in a fight or flight mode. And it's, it's pretty much anything that causes us chronic inflammation. So food intolerances, uh, emotional stressors that are chronic, uh, junk food, sugar, processed uh, flour, processed oils, also uh, environmental toxins, nutritional deficiencies, these all cause the body to and the brain to register that something is not right and you need protection. And so it starts to liberate more cortisol, whether to bolster your immune system if you're exposed to uh, chronic inflammatory triggers, to bolster your, um, your cortisol to, to keep inflammation under control. And so we can end up with a lot of triggers that overwhelm multiple systems in our body, from our gut to our detoxification systems to our actual stress response and our immune system. So what I coined in my practice sort of accidentally was a term called SOS, survival overdrive syndrome. And what was happening was so many of my patients were saying to me, Dr. Rahm, I feel like I'm constantly in overdrive. I feel like I'm constantly in survival mode. 
And at the same time, I was seeing all these medical conditions in them that were directly related to this HPA axis, to their literal survival system being in overdrive. And so I started to use this term, survival overdrive, and talk about this syndrome of symptoms I was seeing. And one clever woman said, ha, huh, sounds like survival overdrive syndrome. And when, I, when she said it, immediately SOS was evident to me. And what I also really loved about SOS as an acronym is that what, one of the things is that I really, truly, after 35 years of working in women's health, have come to see that disease very rarely presents out of nowhere. Sure, we can have a traumatic accident or, a, you know, an acute exposure to an infection. You know, you eat some food and you get gastroenteritis or something like that. But chronic disease is never sudden. It's chronic. And it is a result of years or a lifetime of insults. And what so many of us do is we put off listening to the little symptoms until they're bigger symptoms, until they're screaming symptoms, until they're medical syndromes, until they're diseases. And so one of the things I really work with in my practice is to help women to learn to listen to their bodies so they're recognizing and responding to the small symptoms, things like thirst, hunger, the need to go to the bathroom, the need to rest and sleep rather than always ignoring those. And, and certainly things like digestive problems, headaches, small aches and pains, the little dysregulations that Western medicine just tells us are normal parts of living, which may on occasion be, but I mean rare occasion. If someone's having these monthly, weekly, or daily, that's chronic and needs some form of adjustment in the lifestyle diet or uh, of self-care or health care to address. The other thing about SOS that I really love as a concept and an acronym is that it's a call for help. If somebody is calling us for help, if a friend or loved one called us for help in extremis, most of us would not say, what is wrong with this person? Why are they bothering me? We would be in a compassionate mode. We would go into a compassionate response, or at least I hope so. Obviously, if they're calling on you over and over, that's a different thing. But <clears throat> our response would be compassion. Yet all too often, what I experience in my practice is seeing women beating themselves up and blaming themselves and thinking, what's wrong with me? What am I not doing enough of? So reminding ourselves to have a compassionate response to our symptoms and even our medical conditions is critically important. And as practitioners, reminding our patients to do that is also critically important. So as I mentioned, what happens with <clears throat> This overactivation or chronic activation of the adrenal stress response with the chronic production of extra adrenaline or extra cortisol is that it's too much of a good thing. These short-lived responses that are meant to actually protect us and even stimulate us and make us more alert start to cause us harm. And there are some pretty big areas we see that in. And I want to share these with you because as you see these areas, you'll, if you're a patient, you'll say, oh, my gosh, I can see myself in three or four or five of these, and I can see how this relates back to this SOS or my stress response. And remember, again, it's not just emotional stress. It's all these different impacts and triggers that can be affecting us, the environmental triggers, the food triggers, et cetera. And if you are a practitioner, trying to look at these, symptoms and these separate areas of impact as having an underlying root cause can make it a lot more, can make you a lot more effective in helping your patients find solutions. So the first area is sleep impact. Adrenaline has the power to make us hypervigilant. It's how it makes us super alert and super aware. Unfortunately, when we are overproducing it, it's keeping us alert and vigilant all the time. That can, one, cause chronic anxiety, as I'm going to talk about in a minute, but two, it leads to the phenomenon called tired and wired. It makes you alert even when you need to go to sleep. So when you have that experience of laying down at night, but you feel like your brain is still on, or even if your eyes are closed, you feel like the light bulb is still on, you can't settle down, that's usually an impact of this system being activated. So that's one of the symptoms you can look for. Cortisol, additionally, directly suppresses melatonin, 
Cortisol has a diurnal rhythm. It's supposed to be high in the morning when we wake up. It gives us the activation or cortisol activation response to help us feel awake in the morning. But it's supposed to decrescendo through the day so that by the time you're going to sleep at night, it's close to its nadir, close to its lowest point. It allows you to fall asleep because you're out of that sympathetic mode, but also it's, it's, um, it's decline allows melatonin to elevate. And melatonin is very important, not only for our ability to sleep and have a regulated uh, circadian rhythm, but it is responsible for detoxification, not only physical detoxification, but also detoxification processes that are happening in our brain while we sleep. So the dual impact of not having your melatonin elevate as a result of elevated cortisol that's suppressing it, that you're not able to get to sleep well, and you're not able to detoxify effectively. And we know that the long-term impacts of that are significant, not just brain fog in the short term, but we know that women, for example, who are working night shifts who have dysregulated cortisol and melatonin have a higher risk of obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, stroke, breast cancer, and dementia. And this is all a direct impact of this hormonal dysregulation. So this is really, um, really significant. We also know that women who are uh, having cortisol dysregulation, particularly nighttime elevations of cortisol, have disrupted sleep, tend to have night wakening, tend to not wake refreshed in the morning, tend to be about five pounds heavier on average, and during the day tend to have more cravings for caffeine, carbohydrates, and sugar, which only adds to the problem because those are uh, sugar and the processed carbs are, are inflammatory, but it adds to weight gain and you know, round and round we go with a vicious cycle. So sleep disruptions are always an indication to look at the disruption in this HPA axis. Now I mentioned with mood impact that um, this hypervigilance can cause anxiety and anxiety really is an escalating problem in our culture. Most people have some small level of anxiety. Generalized anxiety disorder has increased. Severe anxiety has increased. But it's not just anxiety as a result of this chronic hypervigilance, this chronic looking out for what your brain is chronically looking out for what can go wrong and really thinks that something is about to go wrong. Um, so it can affect your outlook on life. It can make you more negative about your ability to be successful in life. On a very physical, this is not woo-woo, oh, my outlook affects my success. You know, if I think positive, I'm going to have more money and a better job. This literally can be impacting your ability to believe in yourself, to take chances on new opportunities because your brain is saying, you gotta play it safe, you gotta play it safe, we've gotta protect you. This is literally the subtext of what's going on and um, can dramatically affect your, con your self-confidence, so it can affect your performance at work. Cortisol also acts as a depressant. So over time, cortisol can make you, initially cortisol can make you feel very agitated as you may have experienced if you've ever taken prednisone. But over time, long-term prednisone and long-term exposure to cortisol can actually cause chronic depression. And one uh, clue that cortisol is disrupted is also morning depression. So it can be depression anytime, but morning depression is something really key to look at because it can also suggest disrupted cortisol. Now, weight is an enormous problem in our culture. You know, I'm very body positive and I think we can have beautiful, beautiful bodies at many different sizes. At the same time, we're a culture that is struggling under no pun intended, the medical weight of overweightness and obesity, and it's causing an exponential increase in diabetes, cardiovascular disease, stroke, and what's now called type 3 diabetes or dementia. And I call this beyond salt, sugar, and fat because so many of our wonderful health writers um, have talked about the impact of the food industry on sugar, on, on our weight, and particularly um, the promotion of sugar and fat. And these are certainly feeding the problem. But stress is probably the biggest trigger that causes us to go for the sugar, fat, and salt. And a lot of people blame themselves. They say, well, I just you know, I don't have the willpower to control myself, and no matter what I do, I keep packing on this weight, and no matter what I do, I can't lose weight. And what's really fascinating is that cortisol, when we are under the impact of chronic cortisol exposure, again, as you know, if you have ever prescribed or taken prednisone, it can cause you, and it's a corticosteroid, it can cause you to balloon up 
in your weight quite quickly, and especially around your middle. Steroid hormones, cortisol, makes you particularly pack on belly fat. And belly fat is especially dangerous. Now, what's happening is when your brain perceives that you are under threat, it doesn't know that that threat does not exclude famine. In fact, famine and lack of food are one of our primitive hardwirings for getting this stress system activated. And it partly has to do with um, evolving during times of feast or famine when we were relying on the availability of food from our environment. So during lean times, we would pack on more nourishment from our calories that we did ingest. When you're under the impact of cortisol activated by stress, activated by chronic inflammation, cortisol makes your body retain weight as a protective mechanism. And it makes, it re it makes you retain weight around, that mid around your middle, not accidentally. Part of what happens when you pack on weight around your middle is that that weight, that those fat cells are actually communicating with your brain and they're sabotaging your leptin and ghrelin signaling, your brain's ability to create fullness or satiety and hunger sensations for you. And so you start to have more hunger because your body is trying to get you to eat more to protect you from this potential impending famine, and also your body is saying, well, we're burning up a lot of energy being in this fight or flight mode, and we need to have more energy in case we have to fight or flight mode more, so we're going to hold on to that weight for that reason also. And so you pack on this belly fat, it confuses your hunger and satiety signals, but interestingly, it also makes sugar and salt taste more salient. It makes them taste better. So it's not just that you're now craving this muffin and packing that weight around your middle, but that is the best tasting muffin you've ever had, and now you're not even sure when you're hungry or full, so you want more and more and more. Interestingly, cortisol also, remember I said before, cortisol prevents you from doing some more calculated thinking and it puts you into a more reactive mode. It's trying to get you to react spontaneously and primitively, uh, instinctively, rather than thinking so much. It does that partly by sabotaging your willpower. So it actually changes the neural firing of your frontal cortex so that you don't have as much executive function. So when someone says, it's, it's, it, I have no willpower, it's not because they are weak or not able to exercise their willpower. It's actually because it's been sabotaged. And then they're in a vicious cycle of being under stress, having this belly fat, wanting more sugar, tasting better, and their willpower sabotage. It's very hard to break out of that. We're going to talk about how you can do that. And here I just mentioned that mind and willpower. Um, it also affects your cognitive functioning in the same way by affecting your executive functioning capacities in such that it can cause what many women call brain fog. So you can think about things that are stressing you out, but it's a lot harder to sit down and write that paper, do that studying, uh, uh, complete your taxes, stay focused at work. So you're in a more reactive mode, not as uh, much control over your, your thinking. I also mentioned that when this system gets activated, it's priming you to be ready to fight infection should that fight or flight put you in a situation where you get injured and have a risk of infection. This can be great. A little bit of stress can activate your mind. A little bit of stress can keep your immune system in top functioning. But over time, one of two things can happen or one can lead to the other. Initially, you can have an overreactive immune system. You get sick from everything you you get in contact with. Your immune system's just reacting to everything. Or you're the person who never gets sick when you're under stress, but then on the first day of your vacation or the first day after your finals or the first day after that big presentation is done, boom, you crash and suddenly you have a cold that turns into bronchitis or flu that really takes you out for five days. The other thing that can happen is over time, as a result of chronic exposure to cortisol, um, that your brain starts to say, you know what, we've been reacting for so long, we don't even know what we're, we're reacting against. And you start to get a dysregulated, confused immune system. And by a not too long but complex chain of events, you can actually start to attack your own cells. That's one of the ways that when there's dysregulation in the system or a serious prolonged period of stress, an autoimmune condition develops. And if you talk to many, many women, as I do in my practice, who, and I'm doing air quotes here, 
suddenly get diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis or Hashimoto's or another autoimmune disease, it actually, if you track back, they can look back maybe three to six months before, and they were under an extreme period of prolonged stress. This is a very common story. As I mentioned earlier, also, when you are in this chronic fight or flight or activated or SOS response, energy in the form of blood flow gets diverted away from your gut toward your limbs. Over time, what happens is you can develop inflammation in your gut lining, you can develop leaky gut, but also just the chronic exposure to stress hormones can cause IBS. We already just discussed how it can cause autoimmune disease. You can end up with IBD, inflammatory bowel disease like ulcerative colitis or um, uh, Crohn's. And we know that even short periods of stress, so an hour, for example, of extreme stress, has been shown to disrupt the microbiome for a short period of time, and then it rebounds. A week of significant stress has been shown to actually shift microflora away from the beneficial kind, away from your lactobacillus and your bifidobacter, for example, toward more pathogenic forms. It allows the pathogenic forms to overtake and outgrow the beneficial forms, and the beneficial forms get suppressed. So you can imagine over a longer period of time how this impact can have a detrimental on your microbiome, detrimental impact on your microbiome. And you know, there's very little in our in our physiology that isn't impacted by gut health, whether that be immunity, uh, our moods. We know that anxiety and depression can be triggered, uh, traced back to uh, inflammation in the gut as well as disruptions in the microbiome, uh, and sleep, cognitive function, appetite, um, weight, obesity, how many calories we extract from our food, even if we're eating the same food as the next person, is determined by the quality and types of uh, and quantity of various species of flora in our gut. So this underlying HPA axis disruption can have a tremendous impact on gut health. So when you go to work with a patient, for example, or a client, and we're all about you know fixing the gut and functional medicine, we have to think about not just are we fixing the gut, but what is causing this gut disruption, not just food, but, but um, lifestyle triggers that may be impacting food choices, that may be impacting the gut, but also the direct impact of the stress response on the gut itself. We know that disruptions in the um, uh, HPA axis, particularly the chronic impact of adrenaline, can cause cardiac arrhythmias but also the chronic exposure of cortisol can as well, as well as causing us to preferentially store fat, not only, or excess, um, excess uh, calorie intake, not only around our waist, but in the form of cholesterol. So it can have a huge impact on our cardiovascular health. I mentioned hormones and reproductive impact take a backseat when we're under this stress response. So everything from Irregular menses, amenorrhea, so lack of menstrual cycle, menstrual suppression, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is really metabolic syndrome, uh, endometriosis, which is part hormonal and part inflammatory, uh, infertility, miscarriage, um, and uh, it, a difficulty producing breast milk after baby's born can all, and perimenopausal problems can all be traced back to what's happening in this stress response system, which is the body is preferentially using the building blocks of your hormones to produce cortisol rather than to produce testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone. I mentioned memory and cognitive functions, so I won't repeat that. There's a phenomenon called inflammaging, which means that we're experiencing sort of accelerated aging due to inflammation. So not just excessive wrinkling, but impact on our telomeres, our cellular health, um, and uh, as I mentioned, cardiovascular and brain health as a result of what we know to be called the wear and tear hormone, which is cortisol. So when we have somebody who is experiencing premature aging, whether that is early onset osteopenia or osteoporosis, premature ovarian failure, or even the physical appearance of premature aging, we want to think about what's going on in this stress system. Now, there's a really fascinating connection between the adrenals and the thyroid, which I've just written an entire book about. Um, and what happens is, as I mentioned earlier, when your body is under this stress response, 
it is protecting you against using energy that you might not have available. So for example, your brain may say, well, we don't know if there's a famine coming, or she's exhausted all the time, or she's overactivated all the time. We need to actually help her conserve energy. When we are in an energy crisis, let's say you live in California or you were alive in the 1970s as I were, was and remember the gas crisis, what are we told to do? Turn down the thermostat. What is your body's thermostat? It's your thyroid. So when your stress response system gets activated, when the HPA axis gets activated, it has a number of mechanisms for dialing down thyroid functions, leading to either functional hypothyroid or actual hypothyroidism, measurable hypothyroidism. And that is at the level of the hypothalamus. There's inhibition of corticotropin releasing hormone. There is inhibition of the pituitary stimulating TSH, so it's direct impact on the thyroid. There's inhibition of conversion of the inactive thyroid hormone T4 to T3. And there's also inhibition of thyroid hormone receptor at the cellular level. So, you know, one of the when we were putting together this talk and one of the sort of um, things you may have heard in the sort of um, description of this talk is that there's a counterintuitive approach to helping women who are experiencing fatigue, overwhelm, and particularly Hashimoto's or hypothyroidism, which is that women come to us asking us how they can have more energy. And I think our tendency is to provide a way that they can boost their energy but one of the things that the body is trying to do that we have to help women to do in their lives is hit the pause button. Because the body is saying we need more rest and we need more energy. And how can we help women do that? Sometimes it may be someone who is over-restricting their calories, over-dieting, burning the candle at both ends. How can we help her to feel supported to actually replenish and restore herself rather than you know constantly stretching the elastic further than the elastic will stretch to the point that the elastic loses its resilience and doesn't come back to its more toned form. And that's what we want to think about with our patients. One more area that the um, adrenal thyroid connection um, can happen is that um, it's that autoimmune connection that I mentioned earlier. So Hashimoto's thyroiditis is the most common form of, auto of thyroid disease in the United States, 90% of all but hypothyroidism is Hashimoto's. And so that same autoimmune dysregulation that happens when this system is overactivated can happen here. And here's some of the impact of hypothyroidism on women's health that you can see, you know, everything from fatigue and constipation to cognitive dysfunction, cardiac arrhythmia, mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, weight gain and uh, elevated cholesterol, as well as hormonal problems and joint pain. So it's significant. So how can you help? Well, one is, as I just mentioned, help women to listen to what their bodies are saying, replenish, not push. Think about baby steps and pacing. So, so many women are sort of raised in the American model of healthcare, which is you take a pill and you get well. And unfortunately, so many women who seek integrative practitioners are coming with that same mindset. And actually, so many integrative practitioners have that same mindset. Instead of a pill for every ill, we give a supplement for every symptom. What we want to think about is allowing our lives to start to heal our bodies and doing the simple things that allow our bodies to restore and replenish. Keeping it simple, that's what KISS is. It's Keep It Simple Sisters. So helping women to find ways that simply small shifts that make big changes in their, in our, in their lives. And how can we make sure that we're walking our own talk? You know, we cannot be burning the candle at both ends and asking our patients to do otherwise. If we're not putting in that three minutes of meditation in the morning and an evening wind down because we're too busy, that's gonna ring untrue to our patients when we ask them to do it. And if we wanna go the long haul as practitioners and not experience the burnout that so many conventional doctors are experiencing, we have to take care of our own health. Now, I'm not gonna go into the um, thyroid testing today. I really just put it here because I want you to remember that when a woman is coming in with any of these symptoms, it's really important to do a complete thyroid panel, not just check the TSH, as so many practitioners do. We want to look at what are uh, what's going on. Is she having 
thyroid hormone conversion problems? Is she having an autoimmune thyroid response? Because that can also tell us what's going on down the road. Is she storing active thyroid hormone as reverse T3? Because the body is saying she can't keep producing active thyroid hormone because that's like spending money that she doesn't have in the bank by burning energy. So I'm going to force her to put that money into a savings account that she can't spend, a trust account. And that's exactly what your body does with active thyroid hormone. It sequesters it away as something called reverse T3. So a woman can have a completely normal TSH and even normal free T4 or free T3, but have really high reverse T3 and be experiencing signs of hypothyroidism, but you won't know that if you don't check the full panel. In my book, I discuss the full panel, and I do that on my blogs as well. So that's easy information for you to access just using the resources on my blog. You can also actually test for whether somebody is experiencing symptoms of adrenal dysregulation. There are some very conventionally validated tests that were validated in the MacArthur study on aging, which looked at thousands of individuals and who aged well and who aged poorly. And these parameters that you see on this slide, cortisol, catecholamines, which would be the downstream breakdown products of, um, of your adrenaline, like homovanillic acid, uh, for example, DHEA, uh, DHEA sulfate can all, if they're elevated or, or dysregulated, indicate that this actually is thyroid or adrenal system disruption. You can also look at just a waist circumference or a waist to hip ratio. Blood pressure should be normal. Elevated blood pressure can indicate that somebody's got excessive exposure to stress hormones. I don't usually check albumin. I do always check a total cholesterol on HDL for the reasons that I mentioned in the slide. When in the talk, when we are under this um, activation of this system, we store excessive, uh, store that excess um, energy intake that we're craving as cholesterol. Uh, hemoglobin, fibrinogen, and CRP are all markers of inflammation that we can test on standard, not even functional testing. I also use 24-hour salivary uh, cortisol testing in my practice. As you can see, I mentioned earlier, cortisol should be elevated in the morning and low at night. But this person has a low morning cortisol, a peak mid-morning, and then normal cortisol. So this person is probably actually waking up feeling tired and depressed because they're not getting their normal elevation of cortisol. So they've gone past the point of um, adrenal overdrive into now their body is saying, we've been overproducing this for so long, we got to dial back on this because the wear and tear on her system is going to cause her to damage her bones or damage her cardiovascular system. So your body starts to dial back the cortisol response. And then you can have depression, low function, et cetera. Here's another example of someone who has low morning cortisol, so they're probably waking up similarly, not refreshed, difficulty waking up, but then they're just jacked all day long, and they're probably having a lot of sugar cravings, a lot of fatigue, overstimulation, and then they can't go to sleep at night. So I'm not going to go into all the different aspects of Hashimoto's, but I wanted to give you this basic slide on Hashimoto's first aid. I go over this in detail in my book. But the main thing that I really want you to take away from this talk is not just the details of giving selenium or giving zinc or making sure that, um, you know, you're, you're taking out the inflammatory triggers like gluten and casein from the diet, but that you're really encouraging this woman to, um, to look at how these symptoms are speaking to her health and speaking to what she can do to respond to actually take care of herself rather than push herself beyond her breaking point. The next few slides, I know we're kind of getting down to time, and this is actually an hour talk, so I hadn't, I apologize, anticipated the, um, the Q&A time. Um, so um, uh, Cheryl or Lexi, are you there? Do you want me to go? There's just a few more slides. I can go to the end. And I'm fine for time to still take Q&A, but I want to be respectful of your time and the participants' time. And they have the slides, which go into the adaptogens. Um, absolutely. We, but, you know, we've only got um, a couple more uh, uh, slides to go after this. And okay, great. Uh, why don't wait? Why don't we just skip and why don't you, we skip a couple and just jump in and mention adaptogens and then go to Q&A? That sounds great. So, you know, a few of the things that are really important on this Hashimoto's 
first aid slide that I want you to take away from this is that excessive exercise actually increases cortisol. So healthy amounts of exercise are very important. But overtraining leads to an overtraining syndrome that athletes, the high-performance athletes are all too familiar with. And high-performance athletes know that you need to train and rest, train and rest. And in a sense, that's sort of a model for how we can maintain resilience and adaptability in our lives. But most of us in exercise, but also in the way we're living our lives, are living as if we're per per perpetually training, 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 and never resting. So think about for someone who's experiencing this um, kind of uh, SOS syndrome, this overactivation, or now they've crossed into an underactivation, that they may be overexercising. And as I mentioned, um, dieting, especially excessive calorie restriction, can add to that perception by your brain that there's not enough energy and put you into that famine response. So one of the things that is very important is, is to include healthy carbohydrates in the diet, particularly at dinner time. Eating a sweet potato, winter squash, or a whole grain, one portion or two portions, depending on that individual that you're working with, can actually help to reset cortisol, uh, improve the evening cortisol levels, and help women sleep better. So that's really important. I teach women how to do a circadian reset, make sure that they're sleeping really well. Um, the cortisol food reset is really what I just mentioned. It's making sure that they're not calorically restricting, but that they're also eating regular, regularly. They're getting a good breakfast with a high-quality protein, high-quality fat, getting a good lunch with a high-quality protein, high-quality fat, and a dinner similarly. And that at lunch and dinner, they're including some form of a small portion, but a, a, a one portion of a healthy form of a carbohydrate and not skipping meals, which is a huge problem for women. And then um, adaptogens are a category of herb, which I share with you here, um, that can be tremendously supportive of resetting healthy cortisol uh, rhythm, whether cortisol has become low because of chronic overproduction leading to the body dialing it back, or when someone is in that overactivated state. Adaptogens are an entire other talk on their own. On uh, a week ago Monday, so that would be February, uh, uh, January 30th, I did a Facebook Live over on my Facebook page at Aviva Ram MD, where you can find for free an hour and 20 minute talk I did on adaptogens, particularly for women who are in SOS. So how to use them, how to start them, what the indications and contraindications are and special considerations so that you're not overdriving women and so that they are uh, knowing when and how to use them. So I would encourage you, and I'm happy to always come back, ladies, and do an adaptogen talk. But some of the big questions that do come up is can you use them with uh, Hashimoto's and autoimmune conditions? The answer is yes, based on an extensive literature review. There's no contraindication to that. And you just want to start with the, the um, more soothing, calming, gentle ones for women who are in overdrive. Again, it's that counterintuitive, let's not add uh, something that's going to push someone's energy when they're already exhausted. Let's help them restore and replenish. So on my website, there are numerous blogs about adaptogens, but really do check out the Facebook Live if you have access to Facebook over at Aviva Realm MD Facebook page. And it's from January 30th. I believe it was at 7 or 8 o'clock at night. And you can listen to the whole thing. And you can also scroll through and see my Q&A about that. Finally, for those of you who are practitioners and want to study adrenal thyroid health with me for a short time right now, and for just about another two weeks, there is a special going on. This course is only available to practitioners with purchase of my book. The idea is that you can then use the book as a tool in your practice, I cannot tell you the volumes of women that are seeking practitioners who are sensitive to what their struggles are when they're fatigued and overwhelmed and going to the doctor and being told they're just fine or it's, in, or it's depression or it's anxiety or it's just in your head and believe me, women are still being told that or if they just had better control of their fork going to their mouth or they just exercise more their weight would come down when it's actually cortisol dysregulation or, or a thyroid problem or both. So 
I wanted to create something that really provided women with more practitioners who were sensitive, aware, and knowledgeable. We go over in detail cortisol testing, thyroid testing, protocols, how to, how to balance circadian rhythm, nutritional protocols, supplements, adaptogens, and more. So if you're interested in that, you would go over to avivaram.com forward slash book bonus forward slash pro and join me. It's going to be a really uh, very kind of exclusive private group. So there's going to be a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention and communication. Um, and it's going to be a pretty high level training program that's going to allow you to be a little more prepared uh, with protocols and plans for those women who do come into your practice seeking help for what may be adrenal or thyroid problems or what they think are adrenal thyroid problems. All right, let's do questions. All right, thank you so much. Uh, that was a lot of information, uh, That all of it pertinent. We have a lot of questions as well, so I'm going to jump right in. Here's a let's person who says, I've been having vertical ridges on my fingernails for many years. My doctor thought it was my thyroid, and she's been on T3 for many years. It hasn't helped, along with other symptoms. As far as her nails are concerned, she feels something is wrong. Do you have any okay. ideas? Um, yeah. I mean, vertical ridges in nails are very common as we age and are often not a sign of any medical uh, imbalances at all. I mean, many, many people have vertical ridges. They often start in our 40s, and they do not necessarily indicate a thyroid problem. If you had an actual medical diagnosis of thyroid problems based on your TSH, your labs, um, then that would be an indication to start you on thyroid supplement. But ridges on your fingernails is not. So if you were on that thyroid medication without any reason other than the ridges on your fingernails, it would not help that, and you should not be on that unless you have truly a thyroid problem. Um, sometimes fingernail uh, changes can be due to nutritional status, but again, it's usually not those vertical ridges, especially if they're on many of your fingernails. It's really just sort of a, a change in, in um, uh, protein formation as we age. Okay, excellent information. Here's a person who's had low adrenal problems for years, and they've been on DHEA supplements to help with the low energy levels. And they're doing well, but is there a danger to long-term use of DHEA? Uh, you know, it, here's the thing. DHEA is a supplement, and it's meant to support you while you are getting your adrenal system back on track. But over time, it does start to make your body a little bit more dependent on the DHEA as opposed to your body producing it on its own, um, and it doesn't solve the problem. It's a little bit like taking caffeine for fatigue. It's, well, it's probably a little better than that, but it's sort of similar. You're giving your body something that produces a boost of energy as a pre testosterone precursor, but it's not fixing anything. I can tell you in my practice how often I prescribe DHEA, and it's zero. Um, I, I think a lot of practitioners prescribe it um, too um, loosely, and then people end up on it sort of indefinitely without really ever fixing the problem. The exception to that is if somebody has uh, chronic orthostatic hypotension and they don't want to try starting a, a steroid and you've tried everything else, but even then the frequency with which I would have to do that would be extremely low. So I'm not personally a proponent of it, and I do talk about that in the book and other things that you can do. For example, um, adaptogens can help your body to restore your own adrenal function so that your body is producing its own DHEA, which is preferable. Because then you're getting – and then, of course, addressing the um, stress dysregulation that I mentioned so that your body starts to produce its own DHEA at a more appropriate level. Excellent. Um, here's a question about a person who has a very unusual history of working with thyroid hormone. Um, she was she had uh, some low thyroid numbers. She started on a natural thyroid, like an armor, at yeah. 30 milligrams. Felt better for a week or two, uh, and then it went away. And so a few – so I'm going to cut to the chase because this is a long story <laughs> here. But uh, it sounds like – Every time she, her thyroid would be raised, she would feel great for a week or two. It would taper off. A couple of months later, they would raise it again. 
so that she, you know, because she was now back to sleeping 12 hours a night, et cetera, et cetera. So they would, her symptoms would recur. They would raise it again. Anyway, over the course of two years, she's gone from 30 to 250 milligrams. It's, it feels almost to her as if her body is destroying the thyroid hormone. Like she feels great for a couple of weeks and then it just goes away. And then they, they escalate to the next dose. Is that pattern something that you've seen before? It is. It's quite common. And um, a lot of times there, well, there can be several different reasons that this is happening. One is that when you think about thyroid hormone supplement, it's giving your body the thyroid hormone, but it's not doing anything about why your thyroid is dysfunctioning in the first place. So you really have to look to the root causes. So for example, if someone is exhausted and their thyroid is trying to slow itself down, and you keep giving more thyroid hormone, the thyroid is going to keep slowing itself down more because your body in its infinite wisdom will do anything basically to protect you. So, you you know, it's like, um, it's like trying to uh, put more gasoline in the car when your engine has a problem and you keep revving the engine and all you end up doing is actually burning out the engine. You can't add gasoline to make a car go when the engine isn't functioning. And so you want to think about the thyroid as that engine. So that can be one thing. Now, if you were to tell me that your thyroid hormone supplement needs just kept going up and up and up and up consistently, but not up and down and up and down and up and up more, um, then I would say it is possible that you're having increasing destruction of your thyroid hormone by autoimmune disease and you're just requiring more thyroid hormone. But that doesn't sound like the case here. The other thing is that we all respond differently to medications. And so the thyroid hormone that you're on might not be the best one for you. And also, thyroid hormone doesn't always provide enough T3. So it's giving you T4 more than T3. And so some women actually need T3 supplementation. Um, and the only way to know that is to do a detailed look at your thyroid labs. Um, I give charts in the book. There are charts over on my website so that you can look at what your TSH, free T3, free T4, reverse T3, and thyroid antibodies are doing to kind of give you a sense of, you know, maybe talking with your doctor about supplementing with a medication like Cytomel that gives you the T3 might forestall the need to keep escalating on that. The other thing is that your body may be getting enough thyroid hormone, but you're not converting it. So it looks like you're tired, you know, you're still feeling the same symptoms, but your body is getting the thyroid hormone, but it can't use it. So your doctor may think, well, she must need more thyroid hormone, she must need more, she must need more, because no matter how much I give her, she's still tired, but you're putting it in, but it's never getting to the cells. And so you want to look at what could be causing the um, interference at the receptor level, which I talk about in the book. Excellent. Good. Uh, here's a person who said they that she went into menopause due to increased stress. Is there any way to return to normal menstrual function? You know, there are women who have, actually. Um, there's an herb called Vitex or Chasteberry that has been found to help women who have even gone into premature ovarian failure, uh, even at younger ages or due to an extreme stress, re-ovulate. It really depends on how long you've been, you know, if you've been menopausal for five or 10 years, I'd probably say no. But if it's been a matter of six months or a year, I would say it's worth a try. And, the re and of course, it depends on how old you are. If you're 52 and, you know, this happened two years ago, but now your body would normally be in menopause, then no as well. But, um, you know, if you're, if you're still premenopausal and it's happened prematurely, then it's worth it to try because it's a relatively, not even relatively, it's quite a safe herb. And, you know, the impact of being menopausal on your bones and your heart um, is something to consider. So I would, that's what I would do in my practice is um, I would definitely look at the impact of the stress response and work with these adaptogens. Definitely work with the plan in the book because one of the um, downstream effects that can happen, as you mentioned yourself, is the stress can lead to that dysfunction in the ovaries. Um, and then you can use Vitex as a complement to get those ovaries kick-started a little bit. And let us know. Let us know. And you know, you want to stick with it for about three to six months. The jury will be out for a good three to six months till you till you know it takes that long. A couple of folks have asked about the best type of thyroid supplement. Um, 
Uh, she's, they want to know if the side effects are the same, whether you use Armour Thyroid or WP Thyroid or Synthroid, um, and what's the best way to go, or what do you use in your practice? Yeah, I love it, um, this question. So it's, um, it's totally dependent on if somebody's on thyroid medication or not and how they're doing on it and then also whether they're pregnant or not. So if someone comes to me and they're already on Synthroid and they're doing really well on it but just maybe need their dose tweaked a little bit, then I just, my grandmother always said, leave well enough alone. And I think there's some truth to that. So I just leave them on the Synthroid, again, if they're doing well on it. But if somebody is having trouble regulating their dose, they're just not responding well to it, then I'll switch them to another thyroid medication. If someone's coming into my practice and I am the one diagnosing them with Hashimoto's or hypothyroidism, I almost universally start on armor. The reason for that is even though it's alternative, most doctors are familiar with it. So um, I have a specialty practice. Most of my patients are going to continue also seeing their local primary care provider. People come see me from all over the world. Um, so I want you know them to ideally be on something that their local practitioner is familiar with. But then if they're not responding well to that, you know we try it for a couple of months and they're just not getting results. Then I will try. Um, I'll use Natrothroid, WP. I may try some of the other, you know, like the um, Cytomel that I mentioned, the T3. And uh, the one exception that I always use Synthroid is pregnancy, because the consequences of uneffectively treated thyroid hormone in pregnancy on baby's brain development are significant. Most OBs and family doctors and midwives don't know what to do with Armor. And Synthroid is so standardized that always for Hashimoto's or hypothyroidism in pregnant, in pregnant women, I use that uh, particular medication. Okay. Here's another thyroid question. A person who was hypothyroid for many years had a goiter and felt their best and even lost a little weight when they had, she was on a dose of Armour Thyroid 180 milligrams. Then they did her thyroid panel, and they said that one of her numbers was too low, and they cut her dose down to 150 and she's mm -hmm. lost energy and gained weight and doesn't feel good anymore. And she wants to know how critical are those thyroid panel numbers? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, when we're uh, looking at Hashimoto's, there's a lot of discrepancy in what the upper number should be. So um, whether a woman is or isn't having Hashimoto's depends on that upper number. What we don't want is that lower number to be too low. So TSH is the number, is the lab value that I'm talking about. That's thyroid stimulating hormone. That's what the pituitary is sending to the thyroid to say, hey, time to produce more thyroid hormone. And when we suppress it with too much thyroid medication, you can end up having hyperthyroidism. The problem with hyperthyroidism is that it can actually have some pretty dangerous effects relatively quickly. So it can send somebody into atrial fibrillation, which can be a dangerous heart arrhythmia. It can cause rapid bone turnover, so it can lead to osteoporosis. So you want to be really careful to find that sweet spot between where your thyroid function numbers and how you feel are maximized without over-controlling. And so I would really talk with your doctor. If that TSH is saying like 0, .00 or if it's not readable, that's too low. A lot of women do really well at around 0 0.01, but I would say, you know, talk with your practitioner about what his or her concerns are and express that you're just not feeling as well. Keep in mind also, as I mentioned earlier, just taking thyroid hormone doesn't fix what's going on in your body. It's, it's a supplement to what your body should be producing, but you could also be feeling poorly because you're having excess cortisol production or underproduction of adrenaline or any of the other consequences of um, the adrenal dysfunction. Autoimmune disease in itself produces chemicals called cytokines that make us feel achy and tired from like not getting out of bed. It gives you the same feeling you're going to get when you get the flu because it's the same chemical. So, you know, I would say do a deep dive into making sure that it's not just your thyroid because then you could be over-medicating for the wrong reason. Uh, anemia can cause fatigue, So, uh, but a lot of doctors only check hemoglobin and hematocrit when we also need to check ferritin. So you'd be a great person for the book because I explain all that and what to do with 
a whole variety of labs and what else to look for when your numbers are saying one thing and you're feeling another way. Excellent. All right, we have one more question. Well, okay, I'll do two. Uh, because one, I think, is a quick answer. They wanted to know, you know, we've talked. You talk about this mostly based on women and towards women, but are there men that have some of these issues as well? Absolutely, and and unfortunately, because we we think of Hashimoto's and hypothyroidism and a lot of these syndromes, particularly in women, men are also quite likely to be underdiagnosed or overlooked. So, even though, for example, the book and my blogs are geared toward women. The same exact information holds true for men. And, you know, if you have a male partner or spouse, child, husband, father, whatever, who you think may be struggling with Hashimoto's, absolutely uh, have that checked out. Excellent. And another, and then the last one that's just come in is, can you speak to very low blood pressure and orthostatic intolerance from extreme HPA axis dysregulation? And what can you do about it? Now, earlier you talked about DHEA being a potential to help improve that orthostatic hypotension. Yes. So I mentioned in the talk the, the um, impact of elevated cortisol and elevated adrenaline on blood pressure, and it can increase blood pressure. But when you start to get to the other side of the curve where your body is now saying, you know what, we can't handle producing this all the time because it's going to really harm this woman, it starts to underproduce cortisol and underproduce adrenaline. And when that happens, you get the opposite. You actually get hypotension instead of hypertension. So, um, again, you want to work on um, regulating that adrenal stress system. One of the uh, adaptogens that's particularly often used for low blood pressure is licorice because we know it actually can increase cortisol and um increased blood pressure. So I usually start with that in my practice instead of starting with DHEA. And then there's some other things that can cause hypotension. Um, one of those is histamine intolerance, which is a different talk than what we're talking about now, but something that um, the person writing in the question can also investigate. Um, that's a different condition, and um, it can cause low chronic low blood pressure or bouts of low blood pressure. Yeah. I think we got through all of our questions. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ron, for taking time out of your busy day and your busy practice and all the activities you're involved in to share all this information with you. It was oh, very, gosh. very interesting. It's such a pleasure. And it seems like there are a lot of individuals here. So folks who don't want to do the practitioner training but want to come hang out with me, um, they can go to Aviva. You can go to avivaram.com forward slash book bonus and get a copy of the book. When you get it, or you can get it on Amazon, and if you get a copy of the book and go back to that book bonus page and enter your receipt number, that will give you automatic access to a Facebook page that's a private Facebook page, and it's I'm in there like twice a week answering questions, and it's a great, there's several thousand women in there. It's women only, sorry, fellas, but it's um, a really great place to get support if you're struggling with thyroid, adrenal, or other chronic conditions not just from me, but from my team and from other women as well. So I highly recommend that. It's been transformative for women. I've been shocked and amazed at how incredibly powerful that community is. Well, wonderful. That's. I, can, I think I'm going to be interested in that myself. I'm going to have to check this out. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again for taking time. I hope you'll come back and join us again. You already came up with two or three to. other topics that we need to cover. Yeah, right? <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Uh, thank you thank again. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Just a, a quick save the date. Uh, on Thursday, Dr. Holly Lucille is going to be talking about easy way to detoxify every day. Detoxification uh, is not something that should be done once or twice a year, but something that you need to probably think about on an ongoing basis. And on March 23rd, which is also um, a Thursday, Dr. Jacob Teitelbaum is going to talk about you can get a great night's sleep no matter what. He's going to talk about sleep, sleep issues, and what that means to ongoing health. For those of you who would like to sign up for a free weekly newsletter at Terry Talks Nutrition, uh, just go to the website. We are very, very discreet with your emails, and we will not bombard you with information, but it's a great way to get the latest in inspiration and natural health, and there's even a link on there where you can ask Terry your personal health questions. You can also follow Terry Limerand on Twitter at twitter.com backslash Terry Limerand. We'd be honored if you found us on Facebook. Uh, and thank you so much for everything that you do to help support the causes 
of Natural Health, and I hope you'll join us again for an upcoming webinar. Until we meet again, good health to you. Bye-bye.